there are things happening at the same time. To me, all it looked like was a perfect storm. We well, yeah, was thing. This is back in ninety ninety two. Last two calls, Magic and Jordan. Yeah, you hear what the captain said? The captain said, sit down. Sit down. Well, that's right. Have a seat because you're going to fall. And then... Free throws today. Who's the first one to 50? Who's going to have the bragging rights by the end of this trip? You can't get too close to Michael. It's a foul. The last person was Michael Jordan. And I just said, you know how much Magic gave? <laughs> And Michael's competitive, so he said, Magic ate that? Here you go. Boom, boom. I have a list. Everybody asked and the list came through. An uh, African-American woman who's an entrepreneur name is Peggy Cooper Cafridge from D.C. Tracy Chapman. So when we were driving, driving in your car. Janet Jackson, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Bill Cosby. Before anybody knew anything, was not giving that money back. <laughs> Prince. There's a lot of us in the hood still going through the same stuff. I, mean, I don't live there anymore, but I have to take care of a lot of people that live back there. You know, give us our master tapes back. It'd just be best to let us try running things on our own. Let us uh, sell uh, just like you sell. Because without that, they don't own any wealth. They can't put back into their communities. I kept thinking about what Malcolm talked about, self-reliance, self-determination. I always saw this film as an epic film. You no, know, we want to show the evolution of a man. Malcolm Little, Detroit Red, Malcolm X, El Haj, Shabazz, Halit, you know. Trouble began from the very beginning because we never had the correct budget, enough budget. Did you know him at the time? Yeah, I knew him. How I was going to call him. <laughs> <laughs> we had to really instill an audience that this is a big movie. Warner Brothers and the Bond Company knew going in that this budget was inadequate. We wanted Malcolm X to be three hours. Those motherfuckers at Warner Brothers said, no, we're not giving you any more money. Warner Brothers let the Bond Company take over the film. All the people post-production, you're fired. I was going crazy. How are we going to finish this film? The Bond Company wanted to shoot in the Jersey Shore in January instead of the Sahara Desert. That he was going around trying to get the money to finish the picture. The editing room is closed. You can't pay your you can't pay your editors. You can't pay your staff. Um, but if you believe in it hard enough, you do it. You find the money somehow. You don't stop. You don't close it off and put the picture on a shelf. You can't do that. For me, one of the greatest things Malcolm ever talked about was self determination for black people. Then I said, you know what? I know a lot of proud African Americans that got bank. And Prince was one of the people I called to give me money to finish Malcolm X. This is probably the first time this has happened, where some black folks with some money came to the rescue of the movie. And in order to continue with the film, I made a choice. And that was a choice to go out directly to prominent African Americans. Prince is one of those, all those African Americans that came together so we could finish the post-production Malcolm X. All of them made me promise to never disclose how much the amount was, which I'll bring to my grave. And we kept it quiet. Yo, how come you didn't go to the other Michael? Because at a point, I had my money. That money enabled me to rehire my people. Oh. So there was no interaction between myself and Steel for months. Spike went to people in his own community. Chris is one of them. At Malcolm X's birthday, we have an announcement at the Schomburg Library, 135th Street in Lenox, that all these African-Americans came forward. And the next day, Warner Brothers started funding the movie again. So the world could see the, our vision of Malcolm X. It was uh, the community pulling together to uh, make sure that the movie was done the way it should have been done. Denzel Washington's performance is one of the best in American movies. It's just uh, it's phenomenal. And cut! The first time I sh we screened a film for the two heads of Warner Brothers, co-chairman was Bob Daly, and I keep forgetting the other guy's name. The first time they saw the film was the day of L.A. riots. L.A. was up in flames. Self-reliance, self-determination. When people say that they love you and they respect you, but at the same time take 80% of your earnings, then expect you to fix your own communities, it's not that it's just about the money, it's about justice and fairness. Life my ass, mother f This is a business. Prince, as a Warner Brothers artist, is worth so much. Because when you have an artist like Prince, it's attractive to signing newer artists. I mean, he's a flag waver for you as a brand name. Um, not just in terms of sales, but in terms of the cachet. 
these people loved him and cared about him and his well-being, especially Jamie. Jamie Shoup, she was the second manager who really was his day-to-day. Bob and Joe, and even Steve. Steve had the ears of gold. He could hear a hit song. Joe was the money guy who could always access that. Bob was the formidable one and had a lot of networks of people. More, let's get down to business. They knew how to deal with the crossover market. They saw his vision and they saw how great and genius he was. There was really this mutual thing and if he said, this is my album cover, what I want it to be, if they discussed it, they got it because they could see the vision. They had their thing. Bob would say, I can't get the money or here, here's the money. We're going to do it ourselves. But they were straight up. I mean, they would speak up to him and say like, oh, no, I don't really care for this or X, Y, and Z. And they also had a lot of faith in him. I think they were really good for him. And they did have Earth, Wind, and Fire. Usually we come up with an idea, a magical idea, whatever, and we'll find someone who can help us execute that. Maurice and I are very, very close friends. Yeah, I built the complex for Earth, Wind & Fire. <laughs> Paisley Park is built on the complex. I had to have that built. Now I got it done, I used all of his money, whatever I had to do. The building the complex was in was owned by me and Ruffalo as an investment. This fellow that worked for me, Harry Grossman, he ran both of them. It was a complicated piece of business to manage and I had to keep a lot of people happy. A guy as talented as Prince, I believed this guy would be a star. Once he became successful, he was my boss. Earth, Wind & Fire was not never like that. I could try to talk him out of things on occasion, but basically I did his bidding. As a manager, you have a lot of power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the industry. Prince's lawyer was Barbara Streisand's lawyer. I said, when Barbara did those records that were associated with the movies she made, how much did they give per record to Columbia? He said, we gave him 50 cents a record. So I offered that. And so in order to get a contract, I went to Warner Brothers, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, who was co-president of Warner Pictures. And they wanted $1.35 per record. Warner's was supposed to give us $7 million for the publishing. But I said, how about if it's only $6 million instead of $7 million? And I made a deal where if I can just not give you any publishing, you only have to give us six, and you get the dollar thirty-five a record. But Warner's gets twenty cents after two and a half million, which meant at fifty cents a record, he would have got six million instead of a dollar thirty-five. It's going to get two million. But Warner's gets twenty cents a record after two and a half million. I traded a million dollars of the publishing. We sold twelve, fifteen million, whatever the hell the number was. He'd take me out for a steak dinner. So I tell Prince this at dinner, and I tell him the story. And I saved him four million bucks. And he looks up and he goes, don't brag. He was pretty amazing and sweet. He was respectful to us, the three of us, me, Ruffalo, and Farnoli, until the Purple Rain tour. And then he began to be eaten by the thing. But up until then, he would listen. I thought I had the best luck possible to work with this guy. He really had an astoundingly supportive arrangement with Warner. He owned 100% of his songs. He owned 100% of his publishing. He owned 100% of the complex, Paisley Park, with no loans. So he had all of that, if you understand finance, to have none of that encumbered by any debt. And then when he went elsewhere, all of a sudden, some publishing company gave him a giant advance, which got a big commission to the law firm, and then, you know, he didn't own it anymore. And I did it because he spent money like it was just water. And he'd fly girls in, shoot videos with them. I have a camera crew from Chicago because he wanted to shoot this girl on Saturday. But I protected his bottom line. All the loss on Paisley Park didn't come out of Prince's pocket, which was a write-off. Because Paisley Park, the label, it was not cross-collateralized with his royalties, it was part of the reason why he could keep turning out these self-indulgent projects. He didn't care. Warners, they were losing a ton of money on Paisley Park. Clearly, Warners wanted to put a stop to that. When I first took over the label, he was involved. Actually, had a lot to do with the signing of George Clinton. George called me one day, but he called me in the office at Paisley. A positive nuisance, and he is that positive nuisance. You know, you say, oh shit, he had something, who's doing it? But then it's France. Because we knew each other you know, from way back in the day. I had actually done a club show with the parliaments when they were wearing shark skin suits back when they were trying to be the Temptations.
I wasn't sure it was what we were trying to do image-wise with the label. Not that George is a bad image. I don't care about all his drama. That's part of what makes George attractive to me. So he called me and he said, I don't know if you can help me, but I'm looking for a record label. I was in my office and Prince walked in. What's that? And I said, that's uh, George Clinton's latest album that's looking for a label. Should we be interested? It didn't take him five seconds. We should sign him. We signed George. I'm thinking we get him into Paisley and we get him in the studio with Prince. Prince gets a chance to throw some funk on George, update the sound a little bit. I mean, George had said, man, I would love him to produce me. George was a control freak. He should be. He's a genius. But he really wanted Prince to produce him. But the problem was that Prince took an attitude, of, well, I'll give him some tracks, but who am I to tell him what to do? I respect him too much. Prince wouldn't do it. He, he gave him a couple tracks. There never really was a collaboration. Now, I hadn't really, really considered it for Paisley. We were kind of known for a certain sound and a certain kind of artist that Prince liked to develop. But when I left, my record got dropped. I mean, just like... Was, yeah, he was vindictive on it. Came out, but, out, but they but it stopped just kinda, promoting. Yeah, it right, just kind of came yeah. out. And because just, uh, yeah, you yeah. can't leave. Carmen you, Electra arrived. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was replaced. Million dollars and nobody still cared. She was his girlfriend. I mean, that was they had a relationship. She doesn't talk about it very often. Neither does he. But I think that they really cared about each other. I mean, it was just a professional relationship. He produced the entire record for me and was just a very generous person. Um, I have an album, so I I did videos and I've, Are you I've dancing videos since I was stuff? five years old. Prince. Yeah. Oh, you dated Prince. Wait, sort of. Yeah, you did him. Not really. I was. I forget. What do you mean, not really? How do you not really yeah. date him? Well, let's get before you get to Prince. <laughs> really? Um, I just. I haven't had a lot of boyfriends. I've only been with three people. Really? Yeah. Oh man. In your entire life? Yeah. So you wow. must be repulsed by me. I'm so white. No. I'm sure Prince no. is Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? You did Prince. Uh, we used to fool around a lot in the studio. No kidding. Yeah, it was fun. So you had sex with him? Is he good? Oh yeah. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. How did he let her go? Yeah. I left. You did? Why? Yes. It got too weird? No, I wanted to. I lived in Minneapolis and I wanted to be in LA because I want to work. I didn't want to sit in Minneapolis and not do anything. And was he like really upset? I think so. You do? Yeah. He was in love with you? I think so, yeah. Really? Yeah. Hey, he gets tons of broads, though. I'm sure yeah, he, he does. Too he got long. over he's it. Fine. <laughs> How long were you dating now? him? So he's um, two and a half years. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, this was a long relationship. Mm -hmm. And when a guy like that seduces you, does he lay a whole bunch of gifts and stuff on you? He's very generous. He is. Yes. Yes. No shopping kidding. Shopping sprees. Like yeah. what? What would you buy? Clothes and yeah, cars. Yeah, he would just and... send me out shopping, and I would just buy everything. Oh god. Good lord. Fun. She had moved from Minneapolis to Los Angeles, still under Prince's control, so to speak. She came out here to pursue her career further, and he was okay with it. She was living in, in the apartment that Prince had rented for her. She was watched every second. Prince. I guess somehow maybe decided that he was gonna have her followed and like, I think he like might have bugged the apartment. I think I was about, about 21, yeah. <laughs> because I made that choice, I literally like struggled. I didn't have food and it was like pretty rough. <laughs> it was pretty hard making ends meet. She was determined she was gonna do this on her own. And she never really called home and said, oh, I need money or I need this or I need that. I don't walk around in sexy clothes and I don't do sexy videos and I, you know, I don't do all that stuff, but I'm sure that if that's what I wanted, that's what Prince would probably promote. That was, that was just an interesting period in time, you know, Tony and I like, became really close friends and actually like boyfriend and girlfriend for a short period of time. And I think that, that probably was a lot of the reason why his record got dropped, to be honest. Prince, See, I was there for all of that recording being there we would all hang out and we would go to the go to the studio late at night and you know do background vocals or whatever on his record and he was a he was a really sweet person but it wasn't like prince was involved with my life at the time so it was you know um he's just that way though he just doesn't want you know just wants to keep everybody separated they were looking for any means to cut their losses on paisley park the label by saying i want this hundred million dollar deal that's really the most important thing to me i'm fixated on the advances i get from my records everything else be damned and you're talking about the one the deal where he then became vice president of the company and all he gave them the means that they needed inadvertently he gave them that out if it ain't great, it sucks. You know, when somebody's dangling something in front of you, 
and you you think, wow, well, we're going to make a lot of money, and it, this looks pretty good. But you know, there's a part of me that says this is not really great for my artist. Well, you have to have the courage to say no. You have to say it's not great, so it sucks. By the way, I disagreed with everything that happened after we left. Contract this thing, there's there's no reason for it. Period. And I think it's unlawful, and the moment artists get together and challenge it, it's going to go right out the window. You know, he was unhappy with the the record deal. I really wouldn't say he was unhappy with the record deal. He was unhappy with the business model of record companies. Uh, the rules do need to be re written a bit. You know, record contracts are kind of weird because it's like, uh, uh, you know, when you mortgage a house, you get to keep the house. You know, but record contract is like, you know, you pay for the house and they keep the house. That's the way they do business. Warner's was very good to me. Don't don't get me wrong. They initiated the contract. That's my point. The industry way of doing business is cool for them. I could have gotten into the music business without a contract if that's the way the system was set up. The record company has been financially promoting, marketing, supporting artists like a Prince who many people discovered not right at the beginning. When they have to figure ways to sell the records, all kinds of promotions and schemes, it takes a great deal of ingenuity and skill and inventiveness to figure out a way to reach the public without going broke. Well, there's the A&R department who find talent and help them make the record. You assign an A&R executive to each of the artists that are making records and marketing department, which is made up of product managers and a head of marketing and an art department and a sales department. And then there's a promotion team radio guys who find ways to get on the radio top 40 radio so it's a hard job to get done i never had a problem with the way my music was promoted or distributed my main problem with record companies was an ownership issue when you don't own the master tape they can take the master recording and put it on different compilations and do all kinds of different things with your music all your favorite hits right here right now You get chart toppers from Hanson, Casey, and JoJo. Now, <laughs> delivers nothing but the biggest hits you crave. But to get them, you must call the number on your screen. It's catalog sales. Catalog sales are the biggest money maker for any record label because at that point you don't have the marketing cost. This is the gravy, if you will. You're talking about a lucrative sum of money. Uh, I think I'm better suited to market my own music. The record label owned the master, the physical finished version of that song. In Prince's thinking, the logical counterpart to master was slave. <laughs> 